I'm a chemical engineer originally. Um, and I did, so I did an undergraduate in chemical engineering and then I did my PhD in flotation and I stayed in flotation ever since. So I've very much stayed in mineral processing. So a couple of years ago, we were looking for some new ideas and some inspiration and became involved in the space resources sector. And actually it's been enormously exciting. It is an enormously exciting sector, but I think there's great potential for there to be crossover um, between the terrestrial mining and the space uh, resources sector. And that's really what this talk is about. Uh, so hopefully that's moved on. Um, when we talk about space resources and space mining, the first thing that springs to mind is going to an asteroid, harnessing the metals in that asteroid, platinum, cobalt, for example, and bringing it back to Earth. Which, you know, there's a lot of asteroid mining companies out there. It's, it's, it's an intriguing idea. But the other way that we can talk about space resources is to go into space and use the resources that we find in situ. And that's really what, um, what I'm interested in and certainly what is the focus of this talk. So when we talk about using space resources in situ, what we, what we mean is that we can go um, to the moon, to Mars, beyond, and use the things that we find around us to survive and live and thrive. And for a long time, NASA called this um, living off the land. And it's essentially living off the land. And we can see for both approaches, whether we're talking about um, whether we're talking about metal mining on asteroids or whether we're talking about using space resources, there's a huge number of legal and ethical and economic challenges. Who owns the resources? who says that we're allowed to profit from these resources. Leaving that aside, I think that for, for me as an engineer, the question is, is this realistic or is it merely science fiction? So what we're going to start with today is looking at producing oxygen on the moon. This is the first small step. This is the first step to increase humankind's reach into space and to increase the length of time we can, we can spend uh, in space. So that's our starting point. Can we produce oxygen on the moon? And this is what I'll talk about. So firstly, we'll talk about the case for mining on the moon. Um, what are the what what's the technology? How do we produce oxygen on the moon? We'll look at the role of beneficiation or mineral processing on the moon. So what can we as mineral processors do? And then we'll look at how this can cross over into terrestrial mining. And for me, this is really the critical point. So what is the case for moon mining? Well, the problem at the moment with human space travel is that the launch costs and the mass we need to take to take everything with us is huge. So if we want to go further into space and if we want to spend longer in space, we will need to produce the materials and we will need to produce oxygen and propellant in order to be able to allow us to do that. If we can produce propellant off Earth, it will allow us to travel further. It will allow us to, for example, refuel satellites uh, and to unlock further space travel. The moon is the first step for that. Um, and actually, there's a company that put a cost on this. So United Launch Alliance said that they would pay three and a half thousand dollars per kilo for oxygen in low Earth orbit and $500 per kilo on the moon's surface. So as soon as somebody puts a value on it, we can see that actually there may be an economic argument for this, and this is something that we should start to consider. But as I said, the challenge is that the launch costs at the moment are huge, and that's because of the amount of fuel that's required to get things out of the Earth's atmosphere. So if we want to take a kilo of anything, out of, from the Earth to low Earth orbit, we will require 20 kilos. If we want to take a kilo from the Earth to, say, the surface of the Moon and back to Earth, people, for example, then we need over 400 kilos of, of launch mass, of fuel. 
if we want to go onwards into Mars, then we can see that those those masses and those costs become prohibitive. So what we need to do is produce the fuels that we we need and the um, and um, oxygen for breathing in space so that we can reduce that requirement. And it turns out that actually there is plenty of oxygen on the moon. So if we take a look at the minerals that cover the moon's surface, and the moon's surface is covered in a dust, there's a lunar soil. It's often referred to as regolith. So we'll, we'll come across that word a lot in the, in the talk. So the regolith, the material that covers the surface of the moon, the minerals are silicates, much like those that we find on Earth. We have our plagioclases, pyroxenes, olivines, and so on. The big difference, of course, is that there's no weathering. So we have no um, no water and no weathering of those mineral phases. There are two key regions on the moon. We've got the mare regions, which tend to be higher in titanium and ilmenite, and the highland regions, which tend to be lower in ilmenite. And the ilmenite will be important as we move through mm. this talk. But what we can see in general is that there are that, that around about 40% by mass of the minerals on the moon's surface is oxygen. So there is actually abundant oxygen on the surface of the moon if we can release it from the uh, from those minerals. Got a minute. The other, um, can everybody still see my screen? Yes. Um, the other resource that everybody is particularly excited about on the moon is water ice. So there is also, a, this is a more recent discovery, the discovery of water ice on the moon. And the water ice is found at the lunar poles in the permanently shadowed regions. So where we have these permanently shadowed regions that never see the sun, there is ice bound up in the regolith. And this is hugely exciting. People are very excited about the presence of this water ice because if we can produce the water ice, if we can release the water ice that's trapped in the regolith, then we have both water and we can produce oxygen. Now, the Americans in particular are very excited about this and they have plans to effectively go and put a giant tent uh, over these regions. You heat it up slightly, the water ice sublimes, you can collect it and there you have your clean it up and there you have your water. The problem with the water ice on the moon is that there's a lot less known about it than there is about the regolith. So the regolith, we have physical samples, the water ice, we do not. So there's a lot less known about how it's mixed with the regolith. We don't know how much there is um, and we don't know how we're going to get, get it. So it's a potential resource, but one that we don't know as much about. So if we think about ways that we can produce oxygen on the moon, then we can, as we say, we can produce water in the water ice if we know more about it, so with more exploration. The other route is to reduce the minerals. Um, so we can reduce the minerals in a number of ways, and there's been around 20, more around about 20 technologies that have been put forward that would allow us to reduce the minerals and produce oxygen. There are th four main technologies that have been pursued with any kind of rigor, three of which have been tested by NASA, um, the fourth by ESA. So effectively, what we want to do is heat up the regolith and release the oxygen. And that's exactly what the first two uh, technologies do. We have hydrogen reduction which is the lowest temperature, it operates around about 900 to 1000 degrees C. We use hydrogen to reduce the ilmenite, but it will only give us uh, around one to two percent oxygen yield. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little more um, in a second. We can use methane to reduce the oxide minerals and that will give us a higher yield, but we need a higher temperature. If we go into the electrolysis processes, so molten regolith electrolysis, molten salt electrolysis, then the yields of oxygen are higher. So we produce more oxygen per mass of, of regolith, of lunar soil that we put into the reactor. But again, the temperatures are higher. So now our energy costs are higher. And we can start to see the trade-off between the production of oxygen and the energy costs that are here, and this is this is one of the big challenges. The molten salt electrolysis, that fourth, 
a yield of 100% is speculative. This has only recently been tested. The FFC Cambridge process is a process originally developed to reduce metal oxides on Earth. It produces carbon dioxide as a waste product. It can be altered to reduce um, regolith to produce uh, oxygen. And that's the work of, work of um, Beth Lomax in Glasgow and at ESA. So it's very early stages, but enormously exciting. So we can see there's a range of, te- uh, of different options, a re- re- range of different uh, reduction options. Each of them has their advantages and their disadvantages. But let's focus first on hydrogen reduction. And the reason that we're starting here, and this is the, the main one we're going to discuss, is that the hydrogen reduction process is the one that has been the, the, fo- the focus of um, most of the research that's been done. It's the most established, if that's the right word, of any of these technologies. So the way that hydrogen reduction works is that it targets the ilmenite in the regolith. And I mentioned there were two different regions on the moon. We've got a high titanium mare region, low titanium highland region. So it targets the ilmenite in the regolith um, at around about 900 to 1000 degrees C to produce water, which can then be electrolyzed to produce hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen can be recycled. However, we would need to take hydrogen with us in the first place. So we can already start to see some of the challenges here. The water requires purification. And this is an area that has been um, under, under researched, but it's incredibly power intensive. So even the lowest temperature of the technologies that I mentioned on the previous slide requires around about 45, 44 kilo, kilowatts per kilo of oxygen. Most of that is required as heat to heat the regolith. So we can see some of the challenges that are there and it produces maybe 1% of oxygen by mass. So our yields are low. This concept of producing um, oxygen on the moon isn't a new one. It's been around for as long as the moon landings uh, happened. So we have, uh, working in our team at Imperial, uh, we have an ex-NASA scientist. So he worked at NASA for 30 years and retired to the UK. He bought last year on the um, 50th anniversary of the moon landings, and he bought all his clippings from newspapers, all his magazines, um, from the moon landings in to to show us. And in one of them, from that time, there was a an article about using the moon as a refueling station. So the concept of producing oxygen on the surface of the moon has been around as long as the moon landings uh, uh, happened. And there's been research done it in in, in waves um, over the over, over the past few years. Just over 10 years ago, there was a, a long period of research done by NASA that resulted in field trials in Hawaii. So they te- tested two potential technologies. Uh, this is a this is a diagram of one of them, um, and it it worked. They scooped up soil and it produced oxygen with a yield of maybe a half to one percent of oxygen, depending on where you look. So there has been field scale field scale test of this but in the last few years we've seen a real push this is a a concept that's really uh, received a lot more attention but any of those oxygen production technologies or processes i should say follows exactly the same route so we have some kind of excavation we need to dig up the regolith and we need to pop it in a reactor, heat it up in some way, and we will produce oxygen and we will produce waste. But there's a step in the middle. And the step in the middle is where we as mineral processors come in. And that step in the middle is beneficiation. So we have uh, an excavation and an extraction. But what's been largely overlooked, and this is what we noticed when we came into it a couple of years ago, this is what we noticed is that whichever of the technologies you use, which each of those will have an optimal feedstock. So what we want to do is work out how we produce that optimal feedstock. Now the challenge here 
is that nobody really knows what is the optimal feedstock. So all of these people that have looked into a hydrogen reduction, carbon thermal reduction, electrolysis processes, there's been very little done to say, actually, this is exactly what you want to put in your, into your reactor. You want to put in particles of this size and of this type. And this, we feel, is a, is a, mass, is a big oversight Be, because that requirement defines the whole process. So if we're thinking of a process from excavation through to um, the production of oxygen, then what we put in the reactor defines how big our excavation uh, system will be. And it really defines the scale of the whole process. So what we need to do really is to think about what is the composition of our regolith? We've, I've talked about the regolith in terms of it being a dust. We've talked about it in terms of it having a lot of oxygen and being silicate minerals. But what else do we know about the regolith? Well, everything we know physically about the regolith comes from the 350 kilos of regolith that was returned as a part of the, the lunar landings. So on Earth, there's 350 kilos of samples, which NASA have and guard very fiercely, understandably. Um, and it was by and large collected in, a, in an ad hoc way by the astronauts as they, as they um, moved around the moon. But what we do know is that it's very fine. So it has an, a mean particle size, average particle size of around about 70 microns. It's incredibly electrostatically charged. And this is because of the, the uh, lack of atmosphere um, and the, the lack of water. So it, it carries a, a high electrostatic charge. In terms of quantity, we don't really know that much about it, but we do know that it sticks to things. It's incredibly abrasive. It is completely dry. And it's a really complex mix of particle shapes and composition. But I think we get a better feel for the composition of the regolith from a video. So hopefully on the next slide, this video will work. Should be working. So here is a video essentially of astronauts falling over. Um, but what we can see from this is that it's a very fine dust on the surface of the moon. We can see how fine that regolith, regolith is. It sticks to everything. What you'll see in a second is how dirty those astronaut suits are. So it sticks, it was really abrasive, it almost wore through the outer layers of their suits. We can see the effect of there being no drag, everything that you throw up comes straight back down. Um, and you see how, what a challenging environment it is, even to stand up. So it gives us a feel for the kind of material, the kind of, kind of environment we are dealing with. So let's look a bit closer at the effect of beneficiation on the moon. So we talked to, about the regolith. The regolith comprises, we've got rock fragments, we have some glass beads, pyroclastic glass beads. Now, this is really interesting. It was actually one of the, the only geologists that set foot on the moon who collected these particles. They were uh, attractive because they were they were um, orange, very different color to anywhere else um, that they'd seen. Very little is known about these pyroclastic um, glass beads. We've got um, fragments of minerals, and then the very interesting particles of the agglutinates. These agglutinates are formed by micrometeorite impacts. So when the micrometeorites impact the surface of the moon, they cause fusing of those particles. Without any weathering, there's no way of smoothing the surfaces. And this is what gives rise to these very, very abrasive particles. So we have these agglutinates. There's nothing um, like agglutinates on Earth. And various people have tried to recreate this. And it's incredibly challenging. So if we have our regolith that is comprised of these different components, then perhaps we might think about um, separating components based on their size and their mineral type so that we can provide a consistent feed into the reactor. And this is what we would like to do. So if we take again oxygen production by hydrogen reduction, we know that hydrogen reduction targets the ilmenite. So if we were going to use hydrogen reduction to produce, um, to produce oxygen, then perhaps we might like to increase the proportion of ilmenite in the feedstock. 
And that's beneficiation. This is mineral processing. So we would like to increase the proportion of ilmenite. We would also perhaps think about removing the coarse particles and the very fine particles. Coarse particles might cause a problem with blocking, fine particles. Perhaps we might find issues with dust and sintering in the reactor. So we could start to see how the, the beneficiation process uh, it might be useful in oxygen production. Now here we've said removal of fine to 90 microns. It's fairly arbitrary at this stage, but let's just look at the effect of, um, of what that might do to the size of our production of our process. If we're going to produce an optimized feedstock, then we need to know how our components, our mineral fragments, agglutinates, classes, and so on are distributed through the size fractions. So the first thing we do is to look at the distribution through the size fractions of those different components. Now, we asked um, the space scientists, for example, you know, what's the proportion of agglutinates in the fines? They didn't have an answer because this isn't the way that, that they, they tend to look at regularly. And this is one of the great, um, this has been one of the great challenges and one of the most fun things about this whole um, area of research is that when we start conversations between mineral processors and miners and space scientists, we can see areas where the language is different and where the approach is different. So looking at composition by size is something we do as mineral process, it's the first thing we ask, what's your distribution of, of so-and-so by size? This is not something that space scientists do. There's various other um, key differences as well. For, for example, in one of um, one of our workshops, I gave them a virtual tour of a mine and I said, uh, you know, well, everything's always breaking on a mineral processing plant, so you always have somebody there to hit things with a hammer. And uh, they were like, oh, Oh, OK, well, that's different on the moon because we can't have somebody already there to, to hit things with a hammer. So we can start to see the, the, the differences between the two sectors. But anyway, if we took, for example, a sample of regolith and uh, split the, the, uh, com the components up by size, perhaps we would like to focus on the 90 to 1000 micron fraction. And we can see from this table that that is about 26% of the total mass. So 26% of the mass of this sample uh, that we have um, binned in this way is in the right size fraction. And it has an ilmenite content of 4.7%. What does that do to the scale of our process? Well, if we were looking to target, say, a thousand kilos per year of oxygen, now this value, a thousand kilos per year of oxygen, comes up time and time and again, and it is uh, based on the amount of oxygen that would be required to support one human being on the moon, I believe. So, if we were looking to produce a thousand kilos a year of oxygen on the surface of the moon, what does beneficiation do? What does mineral processing do to the scale of our operation? So here's the study. And this is what we did. So we took our, our feed, our regolith, and we said, well, if we reduce the, so if we take out the ilmenites, sorry, if we take out the agglutinates, uh, and then we take out the glasses, then we keep stripping away different components, what happens to the ilmenite content? So our ilmenite content increases if we take out the ilmenites. If we take out the agglutinates, then our ilmenite increases to 5%. If we take out all the glasses, the glutenates, the basalts, the breccias, then our ilmenite content increases to just short of 15%. So by stripping away different components, theoretically, then we can increase the proportion of ilmenite and this correspondingly then reduces the mass in our feed going into the reactor. Now I should say this is entirely theoretical and it's based, it's just an assumption based thing. Actually, we may wish to uh, target the glasses. There's an argument that the glasses would be uh, a better source of, um, of, of oxygen uh, or, and would produce oxygen at a lower temperature. But if we're just looking for now at what would this would do to our process, we can see on the graph on this slide, on the x-axis there, 
we've got the ilmenite grade. So as we keep stripping out more fractions, then the ilmenite grade increases. Now, those blue triangles are the mining rate. And we can see that as we strip out more and more components, then the mining rate increases. So by reducing more and more of the components to increase the ilmenite content, then we need to have a bigger mine effectively. But what that does do is, you can see by the orange diamonds, it reduces the size of the reactor. So, so by adding a beneficiation stage, we need a bigger mine to produce the same amount of oxygen, but the reactor is smaller. And if it's the reactor that requires the energy to heat the regolith to produce the oxygen, then perhaps this would be a better route. And actually, that the, the, the discussion, the trade-off between bigger mine and small reactor or small mine and big reactor is one that hasn't been had so far. But if we take it a step further, actually, we need to think about uncertainty. And obviously, there's a huge amount of uncertainty in this work. We're basing assumptions off 350 kilos of sample that was returned, all of which has been analysed in very small samples by people looking to characterise the, the regolith. So perhaps we need to start to build into uncert some uncertainty. So we looked in our group at, um, at what would be the required mining rate if we want a greater level of certainty. So we, we looked at varying things like oxygen yield, mining rate, efficiency, um, energy efficiency, and so on. Again, all, all theoretical, all hypothetical. And we carried out Monte Carlo simulations that showed that if we produce, or if we have a 50%, confidence rate, so our mean mining rate is just over 40 kilos an hour to produce 1,000 kilos per year of oxygen. But if we want 90% confidence of producing that rate, then the, the mining rate goes up to over 60 kilos per hour. And if we are reliant on that oxygen supply on the surface of the moon for survival, then I think perhaps maybe 90 to 95% confidence would be more reassuring than 50%. So we can see then a, a mine that produces or an operation that produces 40 kilos per hour or one that produces 60 kilos an hour, these are, these are very different things. And when we start to look at the size of our operations, do we run in a batch-wise process? Do we run continuously? What does this look like? Then these are the factors that need to be taken into to, uh, consideration. But we can see the role of beneficiation. We see where the mineral processor and the mining, that mining um, concept um, or the, the mining expertise comes in to oxygen production on the moon. And actually what we need to do is produce sizing and separation equipment that can be used in space. So separation equipment based on maybe electrostatic and magnetic and even gravity. There is gravity on the moon. Um, just very low gravity um, techniques for use in space. And that's exactly what we're doing in our research group. But for this, we need to take into account the harsh lunar environment. We've already mentioned that there's no water at all. There's no atmosphere. We have vacuum only. You can't make use of drag or any of these other uh, factors. There's, a, there's wild temperature swings. Um, and a two week long day night cycle. So whatever technology we have has to lie dormant for two weeks or has to have a, an energy source that is not related to the sun. It's incredibly abrasive. Moving parts are challenging. Moving parts are not good in space um, and that we have one sixth of Earth gravity. So these are the kind of conditions that we have to design equipment to withstand. So for separations, in terms of mineral separations, electrostatic separation is one of the most promising. And the reason that electrostatic separation uh, on the moon for lunar regolith would be promising is firstly because of the minerals we're using. We're interested in ilmenite from silicates, and this is um, this is used on Earth to separate ilmenite uh, in beach sands. So we have we we know we the electrostatic separation works for ilmenite uh, minerals. It also works beautifully in dry conditions. 
and not so beautifully whenever there's some humidity around. So we know that it works in dry conditions. We know that it works for the minerals. But also one of the great things about electrostatic separation is that we can build equipment that has no moving parts. And that's exactly what we've done in the lab. And when I say that's what we've done in the lab, it's uh, what uh, my PhD student has done in the lab. So he's built an electrostatic separator that is a fixed plate Oh, it's not a fixed plate. It's a with the plates can move, but it's a no moving parts free fall separator. So here we can see the separator that he built. We've got electrodes that can be uh, moved apart and have variable uh, voltage. We have the most beautifully machined collector uh, that the uh, technicians built. Um, all housed in a Faraday cage. And using that, we can start to do investigations into the electrostatic separation of idealized feedstocks. So ilmenite uh, versus silica, uh, and silica. This is our starting point. On the right-hand side, you can see the kind of separations that we get. One of the big issues here is obviously when earth ambient conditions are not lunar conditions and humidity plays a huge role. But this allows us to investigate some of the design parameters and try to build models, mathematical models, which is what the student um, Josh Rosera is doing at the moment while he cannot get into the lab so that we can investigate the uh, atmospheric um, conditions. We also have a humidity control glove box uh, that we can carry out more fundamental um, measurements on when the lab is uh, open again. I should say that the student um, who built this lab, this this rig, is funded by the Luxembourg government. So Luxembourg are um, big into space resources, and so he's funded through through Luxembourg. So that's what we're doing in terms of beneficiation. Um, on the moon, but let's take a step back and go back to mineral processing on Earth. So let's come back down to Earth. I've said already that electrostatic separation is used in beach sand um, concentration, so for separating ilmenites from ilmenite, rutile, zircon, and so on. It's used, also used ef incredibly effectively in recycling. Um, and it had, that's, that's really its limited reach. And, in general, there's a limited amount of research that goes into dry mineral separation. It's increasing at the moment, but it has been limited. Electrostatic separation is in, it's, uh, very, very sensitive to environmental conditions. Humidity being a really key one that affects the performance of the separation. But we must remember that actually electrostatic separation was used to, um, concentrate, Ill, uh, to concentrate sulfides on the turn of the 20th century. Um, so it, it has been used historically in concentrating a wider range of minerals than it is currently used for. But one of the reasons that dry, dry processing fell out of fashion um, in the first part of the 20th century is because water-based methods are much more efficient and very well established and are proven. So let's take the example of flotation which is, as I said, this is what I've done all my research in. Phosphotation is incredibly effective at concentrating um, ores that previously could not have been concentrated by gravity and other techniques. So it can concentrate low-grade sulfide ores incredibly effectively with recoveries over 80% without really trying. So it's it really, when it, uh, when it came in the early part of the 20th century and took off, it took over all of those existing separations because it works really well and it works really well at really high tonnages so we can process 6,000 tons per hour using flotation without any challenges. The problem here of course as we are increasingly aware that we take 5% or thereabouts to final concentrate and the rest goes off to tailings and is left in tailings ponds. So we it works well, but it produces huge amounts of waste from which it's difficult to recover the water. This is one of the big, uh, one of the challenges that we have at the moment and moving into the future. As we move into the future, then we will find that there, and there is more and more pressure on mines to reduce their water, water use. And typically this is done by adapting technology to um, to use less water. One of the examples there is there's a uh, the research that goes on in in flotation, so coarse particle flotation, 
if we can um, float p- more poorly liberated material at um, coarser sizes, larger particle sizes, then that water can be recovered more easily. We send less mass on for, um, for concentration. If we want to develop an entirely dry, modern, dry processing, mineral processing plant, then by adapting technology to use less and less water doesn't allow us to rethink the whole problem. So our argument is actually that you can't develop dry processing by taking an existing process and adapting it so it uses less and less water. Actually, we need a completely new way of thinking about mineral processing. So by solving the problem on the moon, if we can do mineral processing on the moon where we have absolutely no access to water, where we have very um, different environmental challenges, um, low gravity, no atmosphere, if we can solve the, the, the beneficiation, the mineral processing problem there, then we can adapt those approaches for Earth. So it allows us to think more freely around the problem in order to come up with different solutions. And as I've mentioned, there's a huge opportunity here for the two sectors to, the sector has a really high focus on reliability, uh, reliability over production. Um, There is a natural use of robotics and automation and and advances with um, very good at risk control. But also what's really important um, is that it's an engaging subject. So it's at the front. It's at the it's at the frontiers of innovation. If we talk about space mining, space resources, mining oxygen on the moon, it's an engaging, uh, more engaging subject than when we talk about terrestrial mining. And I know from from being in this this field for almost twenty years, when we talk about mining, you know, people aren't necessarily interested. It is a bad thing. But when we talk about space mining, we can engage people. So it allows us to, to talk about resources in a different way. On the, other hand, on the other hand, mining industry has a huge expertise in exploration, resource estimation, this understanding of handling materials, of variable feedstocks on how to, um, how to adapt production for variable feedstocks. The mining industry is really, really good at this. We know it's risk averse. We know it's slow, slow to adapt. But it does have its expertise. And I think bringing those two sectors together allows us to um, to really generate some new ideas. So just to finish, what I think that um, space resources and mining oxygen on the moon allows us to do is think differently about our resources. The challenges on Earth are that we have um, poor efficiency we use a lot of water, we use a lot of energy. There's a huge environmental legacy. We're all aware of that. The challenges on the moon are very different. It's technology challenges. We're in vacuum and low gravity. There's absolutely no water. We don't really know a huge amount about it. And it's completely unprecedented. Will it even work? We don't know. But it allows us a new way of thinking. We have we're starting a resource use system from the beginning. We can start that on, on the principles of zero waste, circular economy, and so on. But we we can bring together different scientists and engineers. Um, and I think that's what is hugely exciting and has the real potential to transform the way that we talk about and use uh, resources in the future. Thank you very much.